Good afternoon. Welcome to the Medical Center Hour. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Health, Humanities, and Ethics, which is um, pleased to be bringing you these weekly programs. Uh, welcome to 2020 and the spring semester series. Today is the first in our series of 10 programs for this semester. We will wrap up on April 1st, uh, April Fool's Day. And so we have uh, a nice series of programs uh, planned for you, and we'll look forward to seeing uh, you at those uh, venues um, on through the semester. Today we have a program called When We Do Harm, Medical Error and the Human Condition. This is the Jesse Stewart Richardson Memorial Lecture of the School of Medicine. This lecture has been an annual event in the medical school since 1999. The lectureship remembers Mrs. Richardson, whose untimely death two decades ago came about because of tragic adverse events in her care at this hospital. Because Mrs. Richardson had enjoyed a career as a teacher, her family chose to invest funds in her memory in medical education so that new generations of doctors and nurses might know better how to invest themselves in care that truly has the patient at its heart. This afternoon, as every year, we are joined for this lecture by Mrs. Richardson's son, Dr. Don Richardson, a UVA medical alumnus and retired local dermatologist. Welcome, Don. And also a warm welcome to other Richardson family members. We're happy that you're here. It's quite a journey that we've all been on these last two decades. On behalf of UVA, I'd like to acknowledge once again this year not only the Richardson family's loss and their generous memorial gift, but also your ongoing collaborations with us. These 21 years, the Richardson Lectureship has sustained a robust co conversation on the subject of medical error, including sensitive communications around medical mistakes and their repercussions for patients families, and health professionals, and also the impact of error and its aftermath on the safety and quality of care. Many years, we've hosted a leading medical expert who's addressed a key aspect of either medical error or patient safety. But other Richardson lectures, and I'm thinking of the one last year, have represented patients and families, their experiences and their input into better and safer care. All Richardson lectures have had their own ways of making a powerful case that the best care, the safest care, derives from compassionate attention, careful, precise communication, and respectful partnerships among patients, families, and professionals. We're delighted for this Richardson lecture to welcome back to the University of Virginia one of American medicine's leading physician writers today, Dr. Danielle Ofri. Dr. Ofri is a clinical professor of internal medicine at New York University, practicing at Bellevue Hospital, and also the founding editor-in-chief of the Bellevue Literary Review, a premier periodical of creative writing about healthcare and health, published out of NYU. Daniel Ofri has authored a date of five books of nonfiction about contemporary medical practice and the issues that play out in patients' and clinicians' lives and in our care systems. She also writes regularly for the New York Times and other publications. This is actually Dr. Ofri's third visit to UVA. It comes after many years. And actually, this one is occasioned serendipitously uh, by her about to be published sixth book, When We Do Harm, A Doctor Reflects on Medical Error. Her book is due out in April. We have the privilege to preview in this Richardson lecture Dr. Ofri's thoughtful take on the human dimensions of medical mistakes and the risks they pose not only to patients and families, but also to doctors, nurses, and other clinicians and the systems in which we all work. I'd like to thank the Office of Quality and Performance Improvement of UVA Health and Dr. Tracy Hoke, who had to be at a, another meeting uh, away from Charlottesville, uh, for partnering with us again this year for this lecture. Finally, I'll mention that Dr. Ofri had no conflicts of interest to declare. 
And please join me now in welcoming Danielle Ofri, When We Do Harm, Medical Error and the Human Condition. Precisely four months after internship, I proceeded to nearly kill a patient, and I did not tell a soul. When I was, I trained at Bellevue during the height of the AIDS epidemic, and it was a busy, busy time. There was no cap on admissions, and patients were really very deathly ill. And so the way to survive those nights on call was to turf as quickly and expeditiously as possible. Any patient you could like bounce off to surgery or GYN was one more off your list. And so one night, I don't know, maybe the 13th or 14th admission, we got the dreaded nursing home admission for altered mental status, right? The demented nonagenarian who someone thinks looks a bit more demented today, you admit to medicine. You know, the patient was stable, lab's fine, radiology fine, just needs to go, you know, has a, needs a bed at the nursing home. I thought this is a great patient to turf. And we had something at that time called IMCU, the Intermediate Care Unit, which was really just sort of a, a back ward at Bellevue where you can kind of warehouse patients who are waiting for a nursing home bed or home services. And so I called the IMCU doc and I said, the patient's totally stable, lab's fine, radiology fine, come on, come on, take the patient. And I pressured this poor doctor and she took the patient and my intern and I, we high five each other, you know, one down and we raced to the ED for our, you know, 15th septic seizing a patient. The next morning I learned that my totally stable patient actually had an intracranial hemorrhage. He was bleeding in his brain, and that's why his mental status was altered. But I'd missed it. I missed it because I didn't actually look at the CAT scan myself. Somebody said radiology fine, and I just took that and, and went with it. Um, luckily, someone else saw the bleed, a radiology resident, paged nurse surgery directly. The patient was whisked right from IMCU to the OR and did fine. And in fact, my error didn't actually impact the timing of the, you know, the patient's care. Um, but I had still made the error, and I was devastated. I was so horrified at myself for not doing the due diligence that I knew I should have done. But I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell my intern. I didn't tell my attending. And I sure as hell did not tell the patient and their family. I mean, I could not imagine a more mortifying experience than dragging my sorry soul to the bedside and telling the patient that I had put their life at, at risk. And um, I didn't speak about it for 20 years. And, um, and I think as a fledgling doctor, I didn't really understand medical error. Because how do most medical students and interns learn about medical error? It's from the M&M, from morbidity and mortality rounds. And I have a crystal clear recollection of my first M&M as a student. It's in the Department of Surgery. And Dr. Frank Spencer was running M&M. &M. And some of you older surgeons might uh, know Dr. Spencer. He was this legend who, in the Korean War, you know, uh, invented the femoral artery repair that saved all these soldiers from having their legs amputated. He was a petite guy, but he had a Texas-sized personality. And he scared the bejesus out of everyone. And I mean, even the deans quaked when Dr. Spencer walked by. And the residents, they flatlined when they were called on by Dr. Spencer. So we're in this big auditorium, kind of like this. And he, um, he points to the intern or resident in the back row who had done the error, I don't even know what it was, and made them stand up. And I can't quite do his marbles in the mouth way of speaking, but he said, well, why even bother operating? Just take the patient out to the hospital parking lot and take a rifle and just shoot the guy. Why even bother operating? And I remember the resident's face just turned this ghastly shade of green. I thought, boy, she's going to be our next admission. You know? Um, and, um, but I was a medical student and I was there to learn. And I learned three things. One is that I better do my darndest to not make any mistakes as a doctor. And second, if I do make a mistake, I am not telling anyone, otherwise I'll be up there being screamed at by Dr. Spencer. And third, I'm not going out to the hospital parking lot. I don't know what the Department of Surgery is doing out there, but I am not going out there. And, now, Dr. Spencer was a wonderful doctor. The patients worshipped him. He was really an amazing guy. But the message that we got was that it was all or nothing, right? Perfection or failure. You're either a great doctor or go work for a pharmaceutical company, right? There was nothing in between. And, um, you know, and, and so our, our, our idea of error is very, very rigid. 
Um, a couple years ago, in the spring of 2016, I got an email from my editor at Beacon Press um, with some medical you know, headline. And as the only physician in a publishing house full of English majors, I'm always on the receiving end of you know, medical queries. You know, my mother's an AFib, what do we do? Can you recommend a gastroenterologist? And so this one, the headline was, medical error is the third leading, leading cause of death. And she emailed, she's like, is this really true? And this paper was from the British Medical Journal from BMJ, got a lot of press, you know, somewhat akin to the press that came with the 1999 Institute of Medicine report to Air is Human that estimated some 98,000 Americans are killed every year because of medical error, the equivalent of a jumbo jet and a half crashing every single day. And so when she asked me this question, I kind of hedged, you know. Um, now, not just because I wasn't keeping up my medical journals, which were stacking up in the bathroom, but because I really didn't know. You know, medical error, third leading cause of death, really? I mean, I'm an internist. I work at a very busy, academic, urban, huge hospital. I see a lot of medicine every day. If medical error was really up there with, you know, heart disease and cancer, number one, number two, I should be seeing it every day, right? But I'm not, or it feels like I'm not. So either the stats are wrong and it's not the third leading cause of death, or maybe it is and we just don't see it. I mean, maybe we're completely blind to an epidemic of you know, medical medicine killing off its patients. I mean, if, if that's truly the case, if medical error really is the third leading, leading cause of death, we should just hang up our collective shingles, right? You know, lock the door, put a piece of paper on there that says, eat your fruits and vegetables, take the stairs instead of the elevator, and stay away from doctors, right? That's it, and you'll do better than coming into our, you know, our house of medicine. Now, the, the paper generated a lot of healthy critique, and um, for, for starters, it wasn't a primary study, right? No one put on a Sherlock Holmes cape and began snooping for fingerprints in the OR. That wasn't it. It was a reanalysis of other previously published studies, and which is not unkosher, right? It, and the authors didn't call it anything but that, but that nuance was lost in, in, in the, certainly the media frenzy, as much nuance is often lost. Um, so, it, you know, when you extrapolate from other studies, whatever biases and flaws were in those studies will now get magnified, especially when you extrapolate to a whole population. So these studies concerned hospitalized patients, right? And hospitalized patients aren't the same as all patients or the whole population, right? Hospital patients are typically older, they're by definition sicker, and sicker patients have many more moving parts. So there's, you know, some issues with making that extrapolation. Um, the other question that, you know, that it, uh, it brought up um, just in the general conversation was, well, and how do you define an error? It's not as easy as it sounds, right? If you give a patient, you start them on 40 of lisinopril at the max dose of an ACE inhibitor and there's a problem, was that an error as opposed to starting lower going up? You know, it's often a judgment call, so it can be very hard to check off which is actually an error. And then, how do you decide if the error caused the death, right? That's quite a bit more tricky than you might think at first blush. You know, you've got a patient with liver cancer dying of cirrhosis, and they are given the wrong antibiotic, one that's, you know, toxic to the liver. That's clearly an error, and the patient also dies. But did that mistake cause the death? Very hard to say, and again, Sick patients in the hospital, especially critically ill patients, have a lot going on. They often die. They often have medical errors. But trying to link, did the error cause the death? Very hard. And again, these studies tend to have small numbers of actual deaths. And then you extrapolate that to a population of 300 million. You can see easily how small variations or biases or flaws can actually alter the numbers on, on a grand scale. And the other question that came up is, well, focusing on errors that cause deaths you know, that's actually a very small sliver of, a death, of, of the outcomes of medical errors. What about the medical errors that cause strokes or amputations or renal failure or permanent pain? Those are big, bad outcomes, almost as bad as death, and we probably should put them in a similar basket. We want to know, you know, if the patient survives but is permanently disabled, that's an error that we want to be on. So really, we should be widening that scope to not just death, but death and major morbidity. But then what about all the errors that don't cause any harm at all, right? Like my error, the patient wasn't harmed, but it was still clearly an error. That may be the biggest pool of errors that are just waiting to happen and harm a patient. And I mean, really, my patient just got lucky, right? If, they, if I discharged the patient home, they could have died. So it doesn't make the error any less bad or any less you know, urgent to address. And so focusing on just errors that cause death misses, in fact, a big pool of errors. And we talk about allocating our resources. We want to know where, you know, where to be on that. So, you know, those are the critiques of, of the paper. 
Now, if you look at the history of medicine in this country for the last 200 years, if that was going to be a movie, it would be like a swashbuckling adventure epic, right? You'd have the heroes in white coats brandishing a stethoscope and a pipette and striding across the centuries, and they hit the 19th century with their medical machetes, you know, um, sanitation and antisepsis, and we're flattening those 19th century illnesses. And early 20th century, we've got vaccinations and antibiotics, anesthesia, and wow, we're just killing disease everywhere. The second half of the 20th century is like a 360 of jujitsu moves. We've got, you know, chemotherapy and dialysis and transplantation and transfusions and HIV treatment, HCV treatment, statins, hypertensive treatment, ICUs, you know, and you will not have even gotten to the bottom of your popcorn and we will have doubled life expectancy. It's an incredible story and it's true and we should be justly proud. But this motif of relentless victory over disease doesn't leave a lot of room in the narrative to talk about errors or harms that are, uh, um, our treatments do because we've really expanded the discussion of medical error now really expands to preventable harm. Right? There are things we do to patients that harm them. Right? We give a patient a CAT scan and we put them into renal failure from the dye. That's not a mistake necessarily, but we have made them worse off. So preventable harms is, is actually broader tent that we think about, including misdiagnosis or delayed diagnosis, all fall in this larger category of harms to the patient that shouldn't have happened. Um, and so but we have this sort of you know, idea that medical progress is just keeps going. And so talking about the harms we do, you know, we don't do a lot of that. Um, in any case, it's all going to be solved, right, by the juggernaut of scientific research. And if we do have a few bad apples in our midst, well, just Send them to the Harvest Hospital parking lot and let the Department of Surgery take care of them, right? You know, it's not really, really a part of this. Um, and, and so medicine's often told to take a page from the aviation playbook or the nuclear industry playbook, right? Because these are other high-stakes industries. Um, and I'm thinking, I hope it's not the page on the, you know, Boeing 737 MAX or the, you know, the page on Fukushima, right? They've had their disasters, too. But medicine has adapted the checklist that comes mainly from aviation. And in, in certain areas for procedure-based things, it's been very successful, notably the catheter-related infections right, with the central line checklist, also the surgical checklist for um, surgical mortality and, um, and complications. And these have been used to impressive effect both in gleaming academic medical centers and under-resourced hospitals in Africa and India have also had impressive successes. And so, um, and the press had a field day with this, right? These checklists with this amazing low-tech, cheap intervention is going to keep all those jumbo jets from falling out of the sky, right? And so hospitals began checklisting everything from DVTs to DNRs, and you could hardly snag a Snickers bar from a vending machine without having to go through a checklist, right? And if hospital administrators love checklists, you can only imagine how much government officials would love them. In 2010, the Minister of Health in Ontario decreed that all hospitals would use the surgical checklist, right? I mean, if the Tanzanians can do it, it would be a cakewalk for rule-abiding abiding Canadians, right? So every hospital took this check checklist, and they had a major data machine to gather data before and after, kind of readying themselves to show the world how you can improve patient safety on a grand scale. Well. It did not quite work out that way. Despite a 98% compliance rate with the checklist, there was no drop in complication rates. Mortality did not budge. And no matter how they sliced and diced the data by age, by sex, by case mix index, and you know, morbidity, by location, nothing, no hint of improvement. So how is that possible? Well. We humans, we are enamored of catchy, easy solutions, right? Like checklists, Boop, just put that right in. We are less interested in the very messy process of getting these things to work with actual human beings, right? Because we're checklisting moving parts. And in medicine, moving parts are people, right? And so we have to think about how we, we do this. And this is the very boring science of implementation. Right? Um, implementation concerns things like, okay, where will the supplies be stored? Who's in charge of that? Who do we call when we run out of something? You know, what happens on Tuesdays when we're always short-staffed? And who's going to provide coffee? And 
what are the unintended consequences, and what are we measuring to make sure this works? I mean, the implementation list is extraordinarily detailed, extraordinarily detailed and very long. It's a checklist in and of itself. But if you don't actually tend to how you implement a patient safety intervention, even the most validated thing is going to fail. Um, because you know, if you say, here's a piece of paper with five boxes to check, we demand 100% compliance, that is all you will get. And not that we're malevolent gaming the system, you know, folks, but we have a gazillion of these on our plate, right? We just kind of check the boxes to make it go away so we can take care of our patients. Right? That's what it feels like. And so we will, yes, we will check those boxes if you make us do it, but that's not the same as implementing a patient safety intervention. So we really need to, to you know, think hard about how human beings work. And when I was researching this book, I came across the research of um, E.T.L. Dror, who was a cognitive neuroscientist from Israel originally. And he has an interesting approach on, on patient safety and medical error, and talks about how these interventions, in order to be successful, must be brain friendly. They have to work with the way our brains work. So this great example is passwords, right? You have a password to the EMR and a password to your, you know, hospital email, your medical school email, your personal email, the x-ray system, the EKG system, the on-call system, Amazon, all these things, and every password has to have a capital letter and a lowercase letter and a number and a special character and a fungal species of your choice and three Latin declensions and, I don't know, the genomic analysis of your pet gerbil. And those whippersnappers from IT who are like barely out of adolescence tell us, don't repeat them and don't ever, ever write them down. Well, that is not a brain-friendly system, right? If we had to actually do that, the medical system would cease, it would cease to run, right? We, if we had to memorize every one of those unique passwords, it wouldn't happen. So, but we are very smart. We come up with shortcuts. We use our pets' names and our kids' names and birthdays, and we repeat them. We write them all down and keep them in our pockets so we can remember them. Because think about it. And we, we do the same thing in medicine, right? A patient comes in with burning in their stomach, right? We could, for each patient, pull Harrison's off the shelf and open it up and page through a thousand pages till we get to the part on dyspepsia and look at the criteria, oh, you've got GERD. But of course, we'd see one patient a day and the medical system would cease to function. But we have these shortcuts or heuristics. We say, oh, I know those symptoms, that's GERD, here's what you do, right? And, and um, these shortcuts is in fact just what has made us so smart, right? That we can handle an impossible cognitive load and actually function. So you can think of these shortcuts as not just the side effect of being smart, but in fact the basis of our intelligence. Um, but these shortcuts also make us prone to errors, right? Those snap judgment diagnoses, we have a certain error rate and often it's quite high because we come to a judgment very quickly. And when it comes to thinking about diagnostic error, you know, those checklists aren't so helpful because it's hard to checklist how you think. So, so addressing diagnostic error means thinking about these shortcuts and these heuristics that we use. Um, so if you accept the idea that shortcuts are really the basis of how our brains work and that shortcuts will occasionally give you errors, you can think of errors as the inevitable outcome of the way our brains work. And so if you insist on eradicating medical error, right, zero tolerance or 100% compliance with intervention, this will not work well. You'll be putting resources in the wrong place because these medical errors are inevitable. And uh, as Dora says, we don't just make mistakes because we're stupid, we also make mistakes because we're smart, something I found very oddly comforting. Um, and, and we have to understand that. And so, um, and so rather than focus on, on, on eradicating all the medical errors out there, which is of course not possible, we might want to focus our resources on error recognition and error mitigation, that is catching the error and trying to fix it in the moment or before it harms our patients or in a way to diminish the harm. Um, some of you know that I, I take cello lessons. I had my lesson yesterday right before I went to the plane. And so one thing, if you play the stringed instrument, you know, you have to find the note. So I grew up playing piano. And in some ways, that's really easy. The F sharp, it's always in the same spot right there between the, you know, the two white keys. There's a black key. But on a stringed instrument, you have to find it. There's no fret markings, there's no little you know, arrow where the F sharp is, and of course the F sharp can be on different strings, and if the heat is on, like in a New York City apartment, like mine is like 105 degrees, the F sharp moves, and if the, it's raining out, it moves again. And so you, you have to find it, um, and you know when it's there, 
when your ear tells you, and that's a whole other training process. So one of the challenges we face is learning to play in tune. That is a really big part of playing a string instrument. So someone once asked Yo-Yo Ma in a, in a magazine for musicians, how does he play so well in tune? And he says, I don't, but I hear it out of tune faster, and I fix it before the audience catches it. That he's faster in catching and fixing it, and that's what makes him sound so much more in tune than anyone else. And with that same idea that our goal is to train ourselves to be better at finding the errors sort of as they're happening and try to fix them or minimize them. So how do we do that? Well, simulation training is a great way to try these things out. But so often simulation is kind of like the old ACLS training. You know, you do, here's, today we're gonna do, you know, V-fib, and now we're gonna do V-tac, and now we're gonna do asystole, right? It's very sort of linear, but that's not how medicine occurs. It's not the situations that we face. So imagine you're doing a simulation on asthma management, okay? Um, so maybe, you know, all the equipment's in the wrong spot that day. And so how do we find errors as that happens? Or maybe there's someone, could be a plant, who mucks with the communication, right? Someone who's being really egotistical, someone who's being bored on their phone, right? That happens all the time, and that's part of how errors happen. Um, or you're short staff, right? The nurse has been floated to 17 West, as they always are, and you're always short staff on nursing. And, and so trying to handle errors in real situations. And even better, you know, so often we'll have, um, you know, a training on sepsis recognition. Well, if you call it sepsis recognition, everyone is in a sepsis state of mind. It's very easy. But what if you have asthma management, a simulation, but in fact, the patient's blood pressure dropping and they're septic. And so recognizing sepsis when you're thinking asthma, that's, you know, again, a more realistic way or, you know, uh, feed in that DVT or the pulmonary embolus when you're not thinking about that. Again, diagnostic error is a big, big thing. And so that's how we can be more realistic um, in our simulations. We also want to make use of the emotional component of, um, of thinking. Um, so one great example is hand washing, right? Probably the number one patient safety intervention. We all know it. The data are there. And yet, our hand washing rates are abysmally low. And so hospitals plaster a poster on every available service and pins and buttons and badges and everything. And of course, we just tune it out. Um, so what if you're on rounds in the ICU and the doctor kind of leads the big posse of students and residents to the bedside after the intern's done their three-hour presentation? Um, and the attending goes up to the patient, you know, opens up the gown, and is about to plunk her stethoscope on the skin when she whirls the team and says, what did I do wrong? And there is quite the awkward silence, right? A lot of shuffling and throat clearing and hands in pockets. And maybe someone finally peeps up, um, you didn't wash your hands. And then she says, so why didn't you stop me? Right? Because in real life, in trying to catch errors in the moment, there is hierarchy. There is embarrassment. There is fear. There are all these things that come up that get in the way of very obvious patient safety interventions. But if we just have our checklist on the five steps and not think about the reality of what it takes to do this in real life, you know, all of our patient safety measures will, yeah. um, will go to naught, I think, or not be as effective as they could be. Now, there's lots of technology out there to help improve safety, and, and one example is the electronic medical record, the EMR. And the EMR has potential for amazing things with patient safety. Now, it also has a, can do many awful and horrible things, and you know, I could talk for another hour on the, the, the downsides of the EMR, but just now I'll focus a little bit on the upsides. So one example is infection control. Right, if there's an outbreak of enterococcus, you know, we run around trying to figure out what's the source of it, and it can be very hard to do. Um, but the EMR can crunch much more data. And there was a hospital that had an outbreak of C. diff, right, a very difficult to control diarrheal causing infection, which can, can kill patients. And, um, but the EMR was able to crunch the numbers of hundreds or even thousands of patient encounters in the hospital, every single one. It can track where every patient was at every moment of the day, right? Who was in x-ray and who was in GI and who went down, you know, for chemotherapy. It can also cross-match it with every staff member that they've been in touch with in their entire stay. It can cross-match it with the time of day, the shift, and all these things. And it was able, when this is a vast amount of data, it can cross-match all the medications the patient were on, what batch of medications. 
and it found the C. diff outbreak came from a single CT scanner, right? One CT scanner that wasn't cleaned. And that's an amazing thing that the EMR can do with all this data that's much harder for us, you know, simple humans to do. Um, the EMR can also kind of, a la Yo-Yo Ma, try and find errors and harms in process and try and mitigate them in the moment. So you may be familiar with the global trigger tool. This is a simple set of red flag signs of to pinpoint places where things might be going wrong. And it's very obvious things, a rapid rise in creatinine, a drop in hemoglobin, emergent dialysis, use of restraints, giving vitamin K to reverse uh, Coumadin, um, revisits to the emergency room, things that may not necessarily be an error but may indicate something is up. And then a clinician you know, who reviews these can say, hmm, I see someone's blood pressure is dropping or vasopressors were given. Let's make sure the sepsis protocol you know, is in place or a patient has needed restraints, maybe we need to go and move that patient closer to the nurse's station. Or this ward has a lot of red flags. They may have more sicker patients. Let's increase the staffing there. So again, to find potential spots where errors are more likely to accrue or harms and try to get them as they're, they're happening. Now technology, um, uh, the EMR can also cause errors, ones we've never even heard of. And there is a bone chilling case that Bob Walker wrote about in his book, The Digital Doctor. And uh, the case is a teenager who's in the hospital at UCSF. The teenager has a genetic immunodeficiency syndrome, so is often hospitalized on lots of antibiotics. And the patient is getting Bactrim, which as you know, is one tab P-O-B-I-D, twice daily, that's it. Um, but in pediatrics, because pediatric patients can range from one kilogram to 100 kilograms, you have to weight base dose it, right? So you don't overdose it. And so you um, do it, it's five milligrams per kilogram. This patient was 38 kilograms, and so when the resident put it in, it, it came to 193 milligrams of trimethoprim, which is the active ingredient. But the tab was only coming 160, so she had to round down. And anytime you round a medication dose, the EMR automatically puts a red flag because rounding is a spot you could have error. So the red flag uh, alerts the pharmacist who then has to call the resident and review the case and um, the calculation, which they do. And they agree 160 is the right dose. The resident now goes to re-enter it. Now you can, remember, you can enter Bactrim as how many milligrams or milligrams per kilogram. So she goes to enter 160 milligrams, but the EMR is defaulted to milligrams per kilogram. So unknowingly, she puts in 160 milligrams per kilogram for a 38 kilo patient, which comes to 6,160 milligrams of Bactrim, or 38 and a half tablets of Bactrim, PO twice daily. Um, but the order has already been approved, right, because the pharmacist already reviewed it, so it goes right to the pharmacy dispensing area. Now this hospital, in effort to decrease medical error, has replaced, uh, has put in a pharmacy dispensing robot, right, because robots don't make mistakes the way humans do. So the order comes in, it's been cleared, and so the robot dispenses 38 and a half tablets, barcoded for the patient, and sends it up to the ward through that automatic chute. So now the nurse receives this, and she's saying, huh, oh, that is a lot of Bactrim, <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, but, you know, it's also, this is a research institution. Lots of patients are there on protocols and wacky, you know, so it's not unusual to get strange doses. But she thinks, maybe I should ask someone. But, of course, if she delays giving the medications, There'll be, her supervisor will be alerted that she is late in giving medicines, which is a quality measure of the hospital, and she'll be dinged on that. So she says, okay, maybe I'll skip this patient, do everyone else, and come back to it when I have a chance to ask someone. But if she, she can't give the meds out of order, because that's another way the hospitals try to minimize errors. So all the pressure is on her to give it, and she can see the pharmacist checked it, the resident reapproved it, the robot, and it's all, you know, barcoded, so she assumes it must be right, and she gives it to the patient. The patient gets a gazillion meds. He just, you know, he doesn't know these are more meds. And at first he just feels like tingling in his fingers and, and then he becomes confused and begins to have seizures and go into cardiac arrest and end up in the ICU. He survived miraculously without permanent damage. But it just goes to show you how an error can be created by the technology, you know, set up to minimize error. And this is an error that anyone with a pulse in medicine, could have picked up in one nanosecond, right? Back from one tab PO twice daily, that's it. You, 30 and a half tablets, it would never have gone through. So the unintended consequences, and we back in the implementation list of patient safety you know, um, efforts, 
you have to think about those because you might actually be causing more harm with your intervention than, than, than um, preventing harm. Um, so when I think back to my medical error, which would be called a near miss, right, because the patient wasn't harmed, but it's kind of a crazy term, right? Near miss just means the patient was lucky, right? He just lucked out that day. Um, it's still an error, but, and, you know, I, I look back and I have empathy for my younger self, and I understand why I didn't say anything. And, um, but um, as an educator now, I look back and think, what a missed educational opportunity, right? Had the environment been such that I could have told my attending, she could have reviewed with us how not to make the error. She could have taken us to, bed, to the bedside and modeled, how do you talk to a patient about an error? Right? That's a lesson I would have remembered. The 20 kinds of vasculitis, gone, right? I don't remember those, but that kind of difficult discussion is one that you need to see it happen in, in the moment. Um, but because I hid my error, um, it was never counted, right? It's uncounted, unstudied, unremedied because of emotions. And think about how many errors are like that hidden. So when we go to try and do research on medical error and count them and find out where they are, we have to know where they are and how many and when they occur. So our data upon which we base a lot end up being fundamentally, irrevocably flawed if we don't figure out how to get all those errors and your misses out into the air so we can actually study them. And, and so we need to actually think about emotions and how they play a role, and in particular the two emotions that affect the ability to talk about a medical error, and they are shame and guilt. Two things that are related but distinct. Guilt is about the thing that happened, and shame is about us, right? Guilt prods us to make amends and fix things and make them better, and shame makes us want to run and hide under a rock and weep, which is what I did. And, you know, and I think now, how many errors I must have made in the wake of that first error because for weeks after that error, my brain was in a fog, my soul was in a fog, and who knows how many subtle things I missed, the subtle signs of wound infection, the slightly off bicarb. I'm sure I committed a host of medical errors in the wake of that. But talking about emotions is not comfortable for us. And of course, we need to acknowledge malpractice, you know, whole other discussion, and for sure, easing the legal landscape is important, it's necessary, but it's by no means sufficient. Um, a couple years ago, I went to another m and and it was really different from the one I had been to as a student. For starters, this one had a chief of service up on the stand, so not the intern being crucified, right? There's, you know, someone high up, and he was talking about an error he had made that week. We're a big city hospital. We get a lot of transfers from community hospitals for things they don't have, and there's always a certain percentage that are what we call cheap transfers. They didn't really need to come, and, and this case was one such cheap transfer, and the chief of service on multidisciplinary rounds said as much, you know, this is ridiculous, this is a cheap transfer, doesn't need to be here. Unbeknownst to him, the patient was a relative of some higher up, and the clerk behind them overheard the comment, and in 30 minutes, he was in the CEO's office being dressed down. And he said to the crowd, that was one of the lowest moments of my clinical life. I spoke ill of a patient in public. I know I shouldn't have, but I did. And I looked around and I marveled at what an educational gift he was giving to this room full of medical students, interns, residents, faculty, that a senior clinician is able to talk about their error, about how awful it felt. But then he offered another lesson, because what did he do when he was finished? He buttoned up his white coat, he went back out into the ward to be a doctor. He didn't hide under the rock. Right? He didn't go off and weep, because that would be the real adverse outcome. And he was able to demonstrate that he had made an error, but he wasn't the error. And that's a crucial distinction. We often get lost in the midst of, of an, an error, um, because it's tragic on all, on all sides. I mean, if every nurse or doctor who made an error quit, then that would be an adverse outcome for our patients. Right? That would cause a lot of harm Harm that I would submit is preventable harm. Um, and so, of course, we should talk about system fixes to make medical errors less likely and, um, you know, to rejigger systems so we don't mix up hoses in the OR. We can make them different sizes so they can't actually fit on the wrong valve. And that, that IV heparin for flushes and IV heparin for treatment are in different packages. So you can't mix them up, which has happened. 
particularly in, in uh, neonates, and has caused you know, quite a few deaths. Um, we have human factors engineering, and we need that to coax our technologies to work with our neurocognitive realities and not work against them, as so often technology feels like it's doing. But we really have to acknowledge the you know, emotions that play a role in this too. And again, it's pretty squishy and uncomfortable, but we ignore them at, at our peril. Um, and because you can't really checklist you know, shame, fear, you know, empathy, all these things are very hard to, to, to calculate on a spreadsheet. Um, and if you think about how many decisions we make, we clinicians make in a day, hundreds, thousands of micro decisions, each of which can potentially help your patient, harm your patient, and all of these decisions are filtered through our intellect, um, which is amenable to the IT checklist approach to medical error, but they're also filtered through our emotions, which are the invisible uh, architect of our uh, actions. And again, we hate to acknowledge that, but it's really critical. And so it re requires the fortitude to admit that we have biases, we have cognitive limitations, it requires a certain amount of emotional courage to admit our vulnerabilities. And these are things that I would recast as a starting point for wisdom, right? It's easy to be smart. Everyone here is smart. We all have up to date, we're very smart. But it's much harder to be wise, right? And we tend to think of wisdom as starting here in our intellect, but it really starts here in our, in our human core. We just need to be intrepid enough to face this honestly. So, so is medical error the third leading cause of death? So it's a really difficult question to answer because it's so hard to get the data. It probably ranks lower on the list of things that mow us down. Um, the third leading cause of death, incidentally, is accidents, followed by emphysema and stroke. But the fact that it's lower doesn't make it any less urgent. I mean, really, any harm that we do to our patients, whether intentionally or not, is something we should be aggressively uh, addressing. Um, and, you know, it sometimes feels like um, medicine is really a team sport, right? Where it's no longer the individual. But the team is not just the doctors and the nurses, but it's also the patient and their family and their close friends who are the troops on the ground who see what's happening. And because so often it feels like we're on opposing teams or on teams with opposing agendas, but really there's just that one goal to help the patient get better. And there's a plethora of technology out there to help the patient get better. But the responsibility for making the technology work falls to the humans. And I think the Institute of Medicine named their 1999 report um, aptly, to err certainly is human, but it's also human to care about what happens in the wake of an error, both for the immediate error with that patient, but thinking more broadly and more forwardly about how to decrease harm to patients, right? For all patients, because we are all patients, right? And if we enter the medical system, we have the expectation that we'll come out better at the other end, you know, or at least not worse off, right? And I think we have the right to expect that our medical care itself isn't not going to harm us. More than 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates gave some advice to his fellow Greek healers in the treatise that he entitled Of the Epidemics. And he wrote, as to diseases, make a habit of two things, will you? <laughs> didn't say will you. To do good or to at least to do no harm. And nobody, I think, has said it better since. Thank you so much. Thank you. You've gave, given us a lot to think about. Um, we have another mic as well. So we have about 15 minutes for conversation with the audience. Questions, comments are welcome. And I will ask that when you have a comment or question, raise your hand. We'll bring a mic to you. And please identify yourself um, before you ask your question. Well, while you're thinking of a question, you know, before you um, do these lectures, you have to fill out your conflict of interest, you know, financial conflict of interest forms. Um, since literary journals don't earn any money, I see no conflict of interest for shamelessly stumping for the Bellevue Literary Review. This is our journal we publish twice a year. We publish fiction, poetry, and nonfiction about health and healing, open to anyone to submit, though I do say we get 4,000 submissions a year, so don't feel bad if you get a re form rejection. But it's really an interesting way to think about some of the ambiguities of medicine. And I did leave a sign-up sheet if you're interested. 
We have uh, some newsletters with medical humanities. It's not commercial at all. If you want, you, you can also reach me through, through that as well. Just and I'll also mention, I think UVA Bookstore is here with some of Danielle's books, although, unfortunately, um, the medical error book isn't coming till Come uh, April. Questions, comments? Restaurant recommendations? Yes. First of all, thank you so much. I'm one of the 4,000 people who submitted a piece this year. Um, but that's not my comment, really, or my question. You made a statement that I want to get exactly right, and I couldn't do it as fast as I needed to. It said, emotions are the architecture of our All right. So I think what actions. I was saying, um, emotions are the invisible architect of our actions. And I think we tend not to think about that, but it really is. I mean, you know, we're all proponents of evidence-based medicine, as we should be. We want evidence to support the decisions we make for our patients. Um, and, but I think we have to recognize that our decisions are also influenced not just by the data, but a, you know, about our emotions. And, and that's not comfortable for doctors to admit, right? We think of ourselves as scientists, right? We wear white coats. Even if we've never set foot in a lab, but it really is true that there's a combination. And to at least be cognizant that our emotions can affect us both for the positive and for the negative, but just to be aware. In the back, yes? Uh, the back thank first. you for your work in this area. Um, I appreciate your insight and your Tell me who you are. personal transparency. Um, I'm Lynn Heider. I'm one, um, a staff chaplain here at UVA. Um, I've come from another system in another state. Um, recently, I'll give you a hint, their football team are the national champions. <laughs> um, but we had an issue and extreme difficulty with providers coding patients who came in through the ED who were um, who had made themselves a DNR. And um, it wasn't until the head of our palliative care service line said, this is a medical error, that we could get their attention. And yet their, their um, attitude was still, well, I'd rather code someone who doesn't want to be coded than not. And um, I'd like to hear your um, response to that. That's a really interesting and challenging situation. I mean, you know, the moment of deciding on a code, you don't have a lot of leeway. I think that's part of the problem. We, it's hard to stop and sit and debate and, and talk about this, but it's really interesting. And I think quite pointed that he described it as a medical error. And I think we are expanding the tent of what are errors. You know, again, misdiagnoses and delayed diagnoses, we didn't tend to think of as errors, but, but now we do. Um, I, I think it is an error, and, and I agree that, that we should think of it in that framework. Of course, we need to be sure that the DNR is accurate and, and related to the situation. I mean, sometimes patients will have a DNR for an unreversible thing, but if there's something that clearly has the potential to be reversible, they do want to be resuscitated. So, I guess it falls upon us that we help our patients clarify that and have that clearly written because really, I mean, to be fair to the paramedics in the ER, you don't have a lot of time. And so if it's not clear, they're going to be forced to do that. But I think it's a, uh, it's a valuable way to look at it and to really think of it that way because the patient did want X and we are doing Y. Yes. Yeah, my name is Lisa and I work in oncology. And years ago, I hung blood with a bicarb line by mistake instead of just saline. Mm -hmm. And um, so the nurse following me found it and got a call. And, and, but somebody had said, you're less likely to be sued if you have made a connection with the patient. So that day had been a magical day with that patient. We'd sung hymns together, like really had a connection. So I guess um, it's, it's like if you make a huge mistake, I don't know. What, what difference does relationship make? And are we becoming less punitive? I think it's a great example. I think to think from the patient's perspective, I mean, I, I think that, you know, patients understand the world is not perfect. I think they recognize that. Um, and errors will happen. I think it matters very much how we respond in the wake of the error, right? And there was a study in which they, I mean, this was a hypothetical, compared patients for whom a patient, uh, the doctor told them of an error or who didn't tell them. The patients who the doctor told of the error were more likely to want to stay with that doctor because they felt I could trust the doctor. If they, if I know, if they tell me this one you know, screw up, I at least know that I'm in safe hands, that I will know. And I think because for many patients, you know, it's one big blur. And so 
if you, to be able to trust your clinician matters a lot. So I think how we handle it, <clears throat> I mean, data suggests that patients are less likely to sue if you have a better relationship, but it's, it's not big data. But it's, it's, if you look, interestingly, at malpractice studies, the vast majority, more than half, have to do with communication. Right? Very few have to do with chopping off the wrong leg. That's rarely the case. It almost always relates to some aspect of communication. So I think you can imagine that how we communicate, and that includes connection and trust, will certainly make a patient able to understand. And again, was the error you, when someone mixed that up, or was it you know, someone who wasn't paying attention or, or, you know, or didn't really care? There's really a vast array of settings of an error, and I think patients can understand that. And if, if a nurse grabs saline instead of ringers, we can understand that. If someone was too busy to take the time to check, that's a different thing. So I think it really matters. The context really matters. And I think, you know, as patients, I think we can see that, that difference. Hi, over there, yes. Hi, Charlie McGee. I'm with uh, General Medicine. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, my first part of it was actually going to talk about disclosure of error with patients um, and that there's really, um, and you kind of covered that, so thank you. The second part is about um, kind of the, the, dual, the duality of suffering. A patient may suffer, but then also the provider suffering. You shared a little bit about your personal experience with that for 20-something years. I think most providers in the, in the room and uh, anybody clinically active can, can uh, appreciate that. Um, can you speak a little bit to um, kind of best practices for regarding disclosure and how we promote healing um, as early as possible and as effective as possible for the caregivers? Sure. So with the medical error, I mean, you know, when I start with a new team on the wards, I usually start by, you know, reeling off like five of my biggest blunders right off the bat. And because I want them to know that, again, medical errors they are inevitable, right? We're not a perfect system and we're humans. And even if we have machines, they make mistakes too and just in different ways. And so, so it's not like if you make an error, but when you make an error, first of all, you have to come tell me, tell your, your supervisor, your senior, and not to hide. And I talk about my hidden error and the cost of that and the cost of my patients as well. And point out that, you know, coming, bringing it to light is actually is better for the patient, again, because we can try and fix things or mitigate things to the best of our ability the sooner that we know. Um, and then... I want to tell the patient as soon as possible. I do, though, want to gather all the information. Because to go to a patient and say, an error was made, but I can't really tell you anything about it, I don't think advances anything for the patient or the caregiver. So we need to take a little bit of time to get our data, figure out what happened, try and understand why it happened. In a re now, some investigation obviously can take weeks or months, but in the moment, to take a few minutes or an hour, whatever it is, to, to get some handle so you're giving patient uh, a reasonably complete set of facts to the best of your ability. Um, if you can identify why it happened, and I think that why is very important for patients. As I was talking about before, I think patients will have a different response. You know, if someone said, I, you know, I just slipped and took the wrong thing, or, you know, I was overloaded, or I, you know, I didn't care. If that's the message that comes across. But I do think patients deserve to know. Um, and also, what are the ramifications and, and the, of that for the patient. We should take the time to research that first so we can come in with answers to the common questions. Again, I think most patients prefer to know. And, you know, you might want to say, you know, something happened that wasn't planned, you know, and because patients also have the right to say, you know, I don't want to know. Some patients don't want to know, and that's fair to respect that, but something happened that wasn't in our standard course that I'm concerned about. I'd like to talk to you, you know, about that. And then just be human and honest about it, I think, is the best practice. Your, your hospital, you know, risk management may disagree with that, but I, I think from, you know, it's important to be straightforward. Yeah, in the back. Hi, uh, so I'm, my name is Stuart Babbitt. I'm also in general medicine, practicing mm -hmm. outpatient setting. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm going to uh, riff off of that and talk about culture. So um, not at this institution, but where I was last, we had patient safety rounds. That was a Department of Medicine-wide uh, program, and there we had uh, the Chief Medical Officer, Chief Nursing Officer, Chief, o Chief Operating Officer, who looked at a case from different sides. And we used something called the Vanderbilt Safety Grid, which is a grid that looks at the Institute of Medicine um, core, core issues and then the core competencies. Figured out which two or three boxes made a difference, proposed a solution, and followed up. That was our old M&M. So culture matters, who's in the room matters, and if you can tie it to an improvement, it makes it much, much better and has a, a lasting effect.
Thank you. That is uh, very true. I, and I think, you know, we talk about trying to make the system safer. Right? We can checklist, we can have 500 checklists, but if we don't sort of shift the culture uh, of, of that receives it, we'll only make small dents, I, I, I truly believe in that. Uh, there's a question in the middle. Um, I recognize that time is, is, is running close. I want the last question here, and I'm happy to stick around and answer questions. Um, or this gentleman right here in the white shirt. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, John Ashley. I, I'm a physician surveyor with the Joint Commission. Uh, we, of course, uh, are a strong advocate for uh, a checklist. Uh, we are, we, the government, insurers, and others are as well. How do you get this need to reduce harm in medical air to deal with the cultural phenomenon that's driving us, which is to document everything and, and, and really make life pretty difficult for our clinicians? Uh, you know, that's a whole long discussion. But obviously, as we were talking earlier this morning about how documentation has become the sake of documentation, and we've a little bit lost the forest for the trees. And so, and I think the example, you know, of the backroom dosing, that all the success of documentation can actually end up creating errors. Um, so I don't have the answer to that, but I know that we have to, again, think broadly. We can't just sort of keep pasting on this intervention, that checklist, and this thing, and that thing, because they interact, and there are unintended consequences. Um, and Joint Commission is coming this week to my hospital, and I took down my kids' drawings. I was made to take them down from my office walls because of Joint Commission. <laughs> and I wish, you know, they should not have, that is not the be all and end all. That is not gonna bring my patients down, my kids' finger paintings. Oh, but thank you. Sorry, let, let's, time for a last question there? Yeah, Our, uh, in that row back there. Oh, is, that's not on. Yep, can you hear me now? Yeah, so I'm a physician, I'm a pulmonary critical care. Um, one of the things that you haven't touched basis on, but I think it's very, very important, is to also um, kind of talk to your patients and be partner with the patients. Um, so a lot of times my CF patients have like tons of medication. So the, the, as long as the patient is conscious, of course, and they can make decisions, I think it's very important to, to be active participants in their healthcare. And, be held responsible. So when, for example, in clinic, when, when I tell them I have 100 results in my inbox every single day, if you have a new pseudomonas, I might miss it. So you check your my chart, and if you see anything that is wrong there that you think it's new, send me a message. And that goes a long way because that not only that they get to trust me, but I get to trust them, and it's a partnership rather than a unilateral um, uh, issue. What do you think about that? And I think that it relates back to this question here about establishing a relationship. And I think, again, if you're all along have a relationship with the patient, I mean, I had a dreadful medical error with a patient that I've had for more than, I don't know, for almost 20 years now. It was completely different than the patient that I, you know, I didn't know because we, we had been together all along and he completely understood. And it was so devastating that I told, I, he, I recommend a procedure that went disastrously wrong. And I said, I can understand if you want to change doctors because I sent you down this pathway. And he wouldn't hear anything of it. And I think it's because we had all this time. Um, so yes, taking the time. Now obviously we're very time pressured and doing that you know, in a busy ward, sitting down with a patient and there are 18 medications and going through every single one, that takes a lot of time. And so maybe we need to, if, you know, in terms of demanding more time, make the patient safety argument about why you actually need enough time to go through all the medications. I know it's one o'clock. People got to run. Um, thank you so much. I'll be happy to stick around after and answer questions. Thank you all, and please, uh, please join us next week. We have a program called Unrecognized Leaders: How African American Employees Transformed UVA Hospital After World War II. And speaking will be Dan Cavanaugh, uh, curator of historical collections, and Dr. Preston Reynolds from the Department of Medicine. And we'll see you then. Thank you again. Thank you.